Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. How does an archaeologist get drawn into UFO research? Is there really debris from crashed UFOs? What happened to the Lanolier? Welcome to the 1024th edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Coming to you from WOON, AM, and FM radio in Wonsocket, Rhode Island, on the Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live and on YouTube. Well, that was Paul, and that was Ben Eno, and I'm Tim Swartz, here to help things along. Paul is with us, too, coming in via Skype. Here I am. Well, hello there, Dad. Lo- lovely to have you with us, and perhaps even grace us with some interesting questions. So well, I'll speak as I'm able. Yeah, take your take your time, Dad. It's good good and therapeutic to have you with us, and I'm sure everybody else enjoys I, having I, you with us as well. So coming to us from the UK via Skype today is Mark Ollie. He is an author, musician, historian, archaeologist, and lecturer, uh, best known for writing and presenting the ITV Grande Sky History Channel's popular television series. Lost Treasures uh, in Europe's Roswell, 40 years since uh, impact. Mark presents his investigation in a series of internationally important hidden mysteries. And if you uh, have any questions, listeners may call in. That's 401-766-1240, or you can email Paul at BehindTheParanormal.com. Mark Ollie, great to talk with you. Welcome to Behind the Paranormal. So, what was Europe's Roswell... And why? Ah, okay. Hi from the UK, uh, where we're all freezing to death. Mm. <laughs> it's very cold over here. <laughs> well, we're wet over here. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, right. Uh, Europe's Roswell. Well, it's um, it's a UFO crash um, with a lot of very startling parallels to what happened um, at Corona, uh, which is Roswell, New Mexico, back in 1947. There's a huge number of parallels, only this one occurred in a small Welsh village called Clanilla, just outside Aberystwyth in mid-Wales in the UK, um, back in 1983. And uh, I've just written a book about it, so uh, that's why you guys uh, want me on here. Mm -hmm. Um, I presume you've got some probing questions to ask. Yeah, we we do the best we can. Um, (laughs) But yeah, give us a little bit of the the event, what what happened, and and, uh, we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, ba- basically, um, the story goes that um, early in the January of 1983, during the night, something crashed on a farm about two miles outside Clanilla uh, in Mid Wales. And uh, the following day, a farmer called Irwell, Irwell Evans, got up to uh, tend to his sheep. Uh, and when he came out to have a look at his fields, um, these fields being quite large fields, four of them were covered in debris. So his first response, looking at all this debris as well, I must have had a plane crash. You know, something's come down in the middle of the night. So he phones the local police, and the local police say, well, we've not had any other reports. They then contact the nearest Air Force base, and the Air Force say, well, we didn't have anything out that night. Um, And then a couple of hours later, the Air Force, the police, and a another unknown agency, uh, we assume the men in black because they're wearing suits, turn up on site. And these guys in suits are ordering everybody else around. And as Irwell put it, it it turned into like a scene from a James Bond movie because there's all these vehicles and they're clearing the fields, they're taking the debris away. And nightfall then creeps in because it goes dark early here in January. Um... And they decide they're going to do it by floodlights. All the floodlights go on. They carry on clearing all of this debris. Gets to about midnight. Well, Irwell's a farmer, so he has to be up the following day to tend to the same animals all over again. So he he kind of says, hi, bye, goes to bed, gets up the following morning, and it's gone. All the debris completely disappeared. But then the story takes a bit of a turn. A couple of weeks later, there's a guy called Gary Rowe, and he runs a UFO Um, group if you like uh, observing group in north wales and he also gets things from uh, the national clipping agency news clipping agency uh, because this is before the days of easy access to the web and things like that and he gets a newspaper clipping in the post and basically sunday express 
which is a, a big national paper, and it's an article that says uh, UFO crash in Wales, Clonilla, and it mentions Irwell. Now, Wales is not massive. It's not an enormous place, and it turns out that Gary has actually got contacts with Irwell. So he contacts Irwell by phone, and he says, uh, well, what's going on? And Irwell says, well, you can come down if you want and have a look. So Gary goes down to the crash site. The fields have all been cleared, but it looks like whatever it was that crashed hit the top of the trees in a neighbouring wooded copse. So Gary's like, ah, okay, I can see this huge, you know, plough through where this thing's come through. T- took all the top off the trees, knocked all the trees in all different directions, scattered wood all over the fields. He says, I don't care how good they've been with the fields, in the dark, they're not going to be able to get the metal out of this woods. So Gary and the team that are with him dive into this wooded area and they get probably about six pieces of metal and a couple of pieces of foil. They then decide they're going to go back in a week's time. So they go back again, and this time they don't really recover anything, but then they decide to go back with metal detectors. Now, before they get a chance to have the third visit, he gets a phone call, Gary, from Irwell, and Irwell's saying, you're not going to believe this, they're taking the forest away. And Gary's like, what do you mean they're taking the forest away? He's like, well, they're, they're bulldozing it. They're destroying the forest. They're taking it away. So, uh, so Gary then gets on the phone to the local forestry commission, and he says... Um, What's going on? Why are you taking this woods away? And the guy on the other end of the phone just goes, well, it's wind damage. And Gary's like, do you normally take a forest away for wind damage? And they're like, no. But in this particular case, that's what, we, that's what we're doing. That's one and way Gary to deal said with it. That. Well, yeah, Gary, Gary said the guy on the other end of the phone sounded like he was almost laughing, you know what I mean? Because it, it, was, it was ridiculous. So that left Gary then with these pieces of, of crash debris. Um, and you can already see from that account there's parallels to Roswell because one farmer, one big debris field, one military, you know, operation stroke cover up, very, very limited press coverage. I mean, there was one newspaper that ran the story for Roswell. There was only this one article in the Sunday Express and so on. It, you know, it really has parallels. But, but then it, it meant that these fragments, these, these pieces of, of whatever they are, UFO debris, it meant that Gary ended up with them do you want me to carry on with the rest of the story yeah please i mean i mean we, right. we're we're getting we're getting we're getting the events we're we're drawing parallels okay, well, and and we can we can we can go from there i think i think what's important uh, is getting getting the details and then we can right, well this expand. is there's a little bit more a little bit more juicy to this then uh, clearly they knew what gary was up to because they took the woods away so somebody was watching the site um, and, I mean, when I did the documentary of this, this is how I got involved as an archaeologist. Gary contacted me, and he said, um, he said, do you fancy doing a dig or seeing what you can find and, you know, accompanying metal detectorists on the site and all that? Well, to be honest with you, there was nothing. The site, no chance of getting anything off the site. There was no flying discs sticking out the ground or alien bodies or anything like that. There was a bit of structural debris with the stuff on the field, but whatever it was had clearly hit the trees and flown off. So there wasn't really anything for me to dig up. So I'm, I'm sort of not sure quite where Gary's coming from at this point. And Gary says, um, but I've got a case with some bits in, if you want to come and see those. And I'm like, oh, ah, Right, physical remains, I can deal with that. That's something that's in my, my scope as an archaeologist. Anyway, we went and we filmed the whole story as a documentary in 2008, because that was 25 years after the crash. Um, and then once we'd finished filming, this is, this is where Gary told me an extra story, because he took me on one side and he said, oh, I didn't really want to put it on camera, he said, but you can have this as a story. Uh, he said, Probably end of Feb, going into March, he said, we'd, we'd recovered these bits of metal. They'd, they'd flattened the woods, and I get a knock on the door. And he says, as I'm walking up to the door, I can see two figures in black stood outside. So he said, I open the door, and there's these two guys, exactly like you imagine, black suits, black ties, black hats, dark glasses, incomprehensible passes. Uh, and he said, I glanced up the close, he said, and there's this two SUVs parked in the close, all the windows blacked out, no number plates. He said, so it's clearly military or upper echelons of military. And one of these guys just said, um, well, Mr. Rowe, we'd like our, our material back, please. Hmm. And Gary's like, well, you can't have it. And this fellow's like, what do you mean you can't? we can't have it? He said, well, 
Gary said, well, I've broken one of the pieces up into tiny fragments. He said, about the size of your little fingernail. He said, I've put them in key rings. And he said, and I've sent them out to all the people I know who've got connections to the media and all these people in ufology. He said, I've got these key rings. He said, and as long as you don't come back, I won't tell them to release them to the media. So at this point, the men in black are like, oh, okay, cat's clearly out the bag, nothing we can do. So they just, you know, walked away in silence, got in the cars, drove off, never to be seen again. But very clearly, not only did they know that the woods is where the crash was, not only were they instructing for the clean-up, they also knew that Gary had been mucking about on the site and got these fragments, so they clearly knew he had them, and who he was, where he lived, and they turned up on his doorstep. So very obviously he was being watched, you, you know, um, so that really, that broad brings us pretty much up to date. The only analysis that, that Gary could get done on the material, um, over here we have British Aerospace that build aeroplanes and stuff like that. So he sent a fragment through friends um, to British Aerospace who said, well, this is not part of anything we're aware of. It doesn't look like any of the planes we've got at the moment. Um, and from the very brief analysis that they were able to do, because back in the 80s it was thousands of pounds to analyze metal um so they did a very brief analysis of it they said it looks like duralumin which is an aluminium alloy that's been around since the days of airships since the days of the first world war so it looks like duralumin but that's that's all we can tell you you know there's a green paint on there that's not aerodynamic there's some resin that's holding stuff together that we can't identify Um, and on another piece there's there's a sort of a rubbery coating that forms a hexagon pattern and they said, we're not really sure what that is either. So that was where we were in 2008. That's that's where we were when the documentary came out. Mm. Um, if, folk, you know, if folks want to see that, by the way, it's on YouTube. You can go and find it. Um, Europe's Roswell. It's it's out on release again. Uh, we've repeated it. So um, that brings us up to now. Do you want to know a bit more? <laughs> Actually, I have, I have, a, I have I, a quick question before we before we hop into the yeah, wayback machine yeah. and shoot forward. Um, I, okay. So, the, so you know, it occurred in 1983. This obviously, you know, isn't you know 1940s America, no, right? The, the response no. was very different. But yeah. the the parallels that I see in the phenomena are are there. The one thing I I, I wonder is, besides your documentary, was there any sort of news coverage or or anything or is this just swept right under the rug well this is this is where it gets interesting um we we didn't have you know marsh gas or weather balloons or anything like that they didn't come up with any kind of excuses for it Hmm. um but because it came down in such a remote part of of this country i don't think they felt the need really to to cover up the crash perhaps in that way um Interestingly, only the Sunday Express ran it. There was a, a guy called Andrew Chapman that wrote the article, um, and we contacted him for the documentary in 2008, and he's a fantastic uh, news guy, great, um, uh, great editor chap, and he kept his notebooks, and he said, leave it with me. He said, I'll go back to my original notebook. I'll see if I can find the source of the story. So he went back, and then he phoned us back a few days later. He said, you don't really believe this. He said, the, the best I can do is he said, I think we came back off the, the New Year break. So that would be around about, you know, 3rd or 4th of Jan or whatever. Um, and then somebody came around the office with a big stack of stories that they wanted writing up, which is what they used to do back then. And he said, I must have been handed the story to write it up for that edition. He said, because I've got no record of where the story came from. We have no idea. Um, and that's where it gets odd, because there are no other publications that ran that story Hmm. local or national it just came out in that one newspaper um it's absolutely true it you know eyewitnesses people on the ground everything so it must have come from either the local police or the local air force or somebody else involved in the recovery because um there were details in there that don't quite match what Irwell said Mm -hmm. which actually adds a lot of credibility to it because every now and again you get something that just doesn't quite fit so clearly people are not making this up. They're not all singing off the same hymn sheet. You know, it's different information each time. Right. Um, and there was a couple of bits about the being good as we're writing on an aerial. Um, well, Erbil doesn't remember any of that at all. He said there were bits of structure uh, and then just lots and lots and lots of this flat metal. 
and tin foil everywhere. So he doesn't remember anything, you know, no girders, no writing or anything like that. Um, but then if you put that in the equation, I mean, that's very, it sounds very similar. The whole description sounds incredibly similar to what came down in Corona, you know, what crashed at Roswell. Mm. Uh, it's just very, very similar. Interesting. Now, why, why the, the, uh, I don't know if I want to call it deforestation, but it's essentially what it is. What, what was the reasoning behind it? Did they ever explain besides wind? Uh, no, the only explanation that Gary ever got was wind damage, and that was from the Forestry Commission. Um, but because, I mean, in Wales, it's a, you know, everybody knows everybody else kind of scenario. So right. cl- clearly the guy on the other end of the phone was, was, you know, he knew he'd been told to get rid of the woods. There's, there's no doubt at all in Gary's mind that this, this guy had been told to get rid of it. Um, and obviously it would have been extremely difficult to extract all the metal fragments from the woods. Um, Gary said they got a couple, they rec- recovered a couple of tiny fragments that were stuck in the trees, actually embedded in the timber. Um, so clearly they weren't going to get all of it, you know. Um, so they were acting under orders, basically. That's, mm. that's where that ended up. You know, I just I just wanted to comment real quick here. The pulling down of the trees sounds very reminiscent of um, when Gary Jones was on the show uh, on uh, November uh, 5th talking about the Denby lights. And mm-hmm. he said a couple of weeks after the uh, lights were seen, the forest underneath that area were completely pulled down. And this, I guess, was a, uh, a, a really old forest had been there for, you know, hundreds of years. Yet within, I think he said, like uh, uh, three to six weeks, it was just completely raised. Exactly the same, identical. And it would be the same commission as well. It would be Forestry Commission. Mm. Um, so clearly there is what we, we would call a playbook. There is a way of dealing with this kind of thing. Um, it's so interesting. Yeah. It makes me think of um, Travis Walton and his his experience and and the uh, the trees around uh, where he was he was abducted were were warped almost. And you kind of see that in some other cases where the ground is warped or there's you know elevated radiation or something like that. But I, I think it's interesting to remove all of the trees. I. I, I'm I'm perplexed as to what the reasoning is, unless it's you know any sort of evidence, right? If there's anything that gets messed with in tree rings, any sort of anomalies or anything like that, uh, and or you know maybe there's some sort of mutation that occurs. Who knows? I'm I I, w- I huh definitely a can of worms to to kind of delve into. But yeah, I, I digress. So as an archaeologist, you know, how did you find yourself saying yes to doing a, a dig? for this this kind of subject um well as soon as gary sort of put the evidence forward and there was actual physical evidence as well already in existence from my point of view it's you know it's it's um trowels in the ground time and it's you know uh, we can use geophysics ground penetrating radar we can use metal detecting equipment things like that um, and I was quite prepared to, you know, throw the full might of my archaeology unit at, at that site. Um, and Irwell was quite prepared to let us. But when we actually got there, we, we had a, a sort of similar wilderness challenge to the challenge that has been presented by Roswell. I mean, they have metal detected on Roswell, and National Geographic did soil analysis and got metal particles off Roswell. But we've got the same situation, really, in Wales, uh, where, in a sense, it is a desert, because just below the grass level, below the soil level, it becomes limestone. It's an incredibly hard, rocky valley. So there would be a limit to how far we could go archaeologically in, in actually, you know, finding stuff on site. I'm not saying that Gary and his team got all of it, um, but surface clearance would certainly seem to be the way forward rather than digging um, because, you know, all we'd be doing is looking for the bits the military missed, you know, and most of it, vast majority of it, uh, was sat on the surface because it rained down as debris from the sky rather than, you know, impact. I mean, it would have been nice, you know, if the thing had actually hit the ground, because there'd be loads and loads of stuff we could dig up. It'd be like, um, you know, Second World War Spitfire doing a, a vertical dive into a field. You, you tend to find tons of stuff, mm. and it's not it's very, very difficult to recover all of it. But in this particular case, um, it just didn't turn out to be that way. Hmm, Interesting. 
So um, oh. I'm, and also I, I am I am I was going to say I am an eyewitness of UFOs as well. I'm, I, I, I was a believer as as it were. Hmm. Um, no, in 1976, I saw something flying uh, overhead when I was a teenager, a sort of uh, a star shaped thing that bounced around the sky and did some pretty amazing aerobatics and then also in the 1980s i saw uh, something that looked a bit like the scout ship out of close encounters hmm. um coming up the local valley um and then all the lights on that went off and it shot off into the sky like grease lightning so i'd already had those two encounters um and as an archaeologist as well when you're out in the field you know doing doing excavations where you're camping out and things like that a lot of my team had seen things as well up in the sky uh, we did one particular dig in Derbyshire and some very large uh, silver saucer-shaped thing apparently came down and buzzed the campsite, uh, flew over the top. So I had quite a lot of fairly panicked archaeological diggers uh, on that particular one, um, wondering what on earth it was. Uh, so, yeah, I think Gary came to the right the right chap, you know, um, and I've always had an interest in paranormal and... Uh, who parts and mm. all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, that's kind of how I got involved. We always find that there's there's crossover phenomena, right? So we, we see that, you know, just, you know, there's UFO activity. Sometimes there's there's ghosts. There's, there's Bigfoot. There's all sorts of other odd things that can happen, you know, whether it's like the Rendlesham Forest incident, you know, around that time. You know, not even around that time, but it, historically, right, there's stories of fairies and you know the the uh green children of woolpit and all these other things did you find that there were sort of similar events that kind of happened throughout history in this area it's an interesting area um uh, even in recent history i'm going to stay with recent history because mm-hmm. there aren't there aren't many legends as such but you mentioned things like the denby lights we've we have got this definite area where certainly for 40, 50 plus years, there's been a lot of unidentified flying object activity. And a a lot of it's documented. I mean, you mentioned the Denbyshire Lights. I saw my occurrence a little bit further north in the Mersey Valley. Um, There's been eyewitnesses have seen things coming up out of Cardigan Bay, which is coming up out of the sea uh, and flying inland. So basically, you've got um, it's 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 kind of the North Wales Triangle, if you like, Hmm. and it goes up the coast, it goes inland and up the Mersey Valley, and then you can join the two points together, and it encompasses probably five or six Welsh valleys and this area known as Snowdonia and an island called Anglesey, Um, and it it is it's renowned to the point where the the local lifeboat station has a phone number, and every time they see things coming up out of the ocean, they can phone the local air force base and report it you know there's a there's open channels in that area historically between people um, concerning these things happening so the fact that we got one that actually hit trees and the fact that we got debris off one in a sense does not come as a surprise uh, because there are literally hundreds of other reports spanning an enormous amount of time in the area that this happened it's almost surprising that it hasn't happened more than it has you know Mm, did it? Yeah, I mean, well, I, I, as time has gone on, at, at least here in the States, I can point to that there's a sort of stigma around, you know, reporting UFOs or seeing them. So, But now, nowadays, that stigma has kind of gone away a bit. People feel more comfortable, especially with organizations um, like the Mutual UFO Network and, and all of that, where they, they offer these, these very um, sort of professional means – by which you can report these things, especially if you have, you have an open line right to your <laughs> to your air force. That I I would say that 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 offers some sort of you know security when you're seeing something that obviously yeah. racks your world view, correct? And I, yeah. I I guess before we before we take our break, um, actually we could take our break now and then we can kind of go into the future and we can talk about what you've what yeah. you've discovered recently so you're listening to behind the paranormal with paul and ben eno with tim schwartz co-hosting as well as our wonderful guest mark ollie we are talking about europe's roswell and all sorts of other fascinating topics and we will be right back right after this introducing bowling for milk 
Join your friends and neighbors at Walnut Hill Bowling Lanes on Sunday, December 10th from 2 to 5 p.m. for strikes, spares, and maybe a few gutter balls. But plenty of fun at Bowling for Milk. Just $25 gets you two strings of bowling and shoe rental, and the milk fun gets half. To add to the fun, we'll have a mini auction for just those in attendance, including an item donated by the New England Patriots. And ON Radio's Cruisin' Bruce Palmer will be on hand to spin the tunes and sign autographs. The Patriots don't play that week, so join us for Bowling for Milk, Sunday afternoon, December 10th, from 2 to 5 p.m. at Walnut Hill. Bowl on Diamond Hill Road, Woonsocket. It's a party to help the milk fund. Local and live at 99.5 FM. Welcome back to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno, coming to you from WOON AM and FM Radio here in Blackstone River Valley's beautiful Woonsocket, Rhode Island. And we're talking today with Mark Ollie with our wonderful co-host Tim Schwartz, and we're talking about Europe's Roswell, and we're going to hop into our our DeLorean here and go right into the future, <laughs> and we're going to move from 2006 onwards, and we're going to talk about all the things you've been discovering recently, Mark, and you don't want to give too uh, much away because you still have your your works and such to advertise a little later on. But let's let's yeah. let's give some highlights. Okay, um, yeah, it's been really interesting recently because. Um, Basically, Philip Mantle at Flying Disc Press, who is the uh, publisher who's put this latest work out, um, he contacted me and said, uh, well, we're going back about two years now, and he said, uh, it's coming up for 40 years since this UFO crash. Um, how do you fancy reopening the case? So I was like, yeah, okay, because uh, it was, you know, as I said, largely unresolved. We hadn't got any um, analysis, and we hadn't got anything sort of, definitive from the MOD or whatever, Ministry of Defence. So we thought, right, well, we'll go for it. So um, we did a Freedom of Information request, and, of course, they said they had absolutely no idea that anything had happened. Um, you know, it wasn't one of theirs, etc. So nothing was added there. Um, but then we decided, um, well, actually, Philip decided he was going to ask Gary, would Gary let us have some samples for analysis? Now, at that point, I'm thinking, OK, well, Gary's managed to hang on to this material for 40 years. Um, he's, he's not going to give it up lightly. Uh, you know, he, he's very protective. He doesn't keep it at home. He keeps it in a lockup. Uh, very rarely does this stuff ever see the light of day. Um, so, of course, we're in communication with him all the time about doing the book and things. And, and Philip contacts him and just says, well, Gary, you know, do you think there might be a possibility of us having some samples and Gary's like, well, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe. So anyway, we, we thought, oh, that's not going to go anywhere. Anyway, a week later, he gets a jiffy bag in the post with three samples in it. So Philip's over the moon. He says, this is amazing. We can actually analyze it. So we decided we we're going, going to do like a double a double test. One um, set of analysis we sent off to Australia uh, and the other one we sent off to America. And the first one to come back was the Australian one. Um, and Australia comes back and it says, yes, we know what this is. Uh, it's not duralumin, it's aluminium foam. At which point, me and Philip are like, aluminium foam, what is aluminium foam? Well, apparently they can mix stuff with aluminium that makes it foam and then go solid at room temperature. And what you finish up with is a, a material, a metal that's extremely light, extremely strong um, and quite versatile. But then they also came back in the analysis and they said, yeah, and, you know, some of this grey resin stuff we've got on here, it's just a particular type of glue from America. So, you know, our conclusion is this is one of ours. So at that point we're thinking, OK, this is going to be interesting. And then the Ameri American analysis comes back and they say, uh, you open the first page of the analysis and in big letters it says, substance unknown. Hmm. So we're like, oh, Right, OK. Uh, and then you get the breakdown. And I, I've got a little bit of the breakdown here. I mean, you're only talking tiny percentages. You're talking about, you know, I think the greatest amount here is 4%. So you've got titanium, manganese, iron's 4%, got nickel, copper, zirconium, and then, and then, 94.6% lanthanum or lanthium. Uh, at which point we're like, okay, and the grey resin, they can't identify. 
um, the green rubbery substance with the hexagons in, they still can't identify. And the green paint on the Australian sample, they've not identified that either. Now, we'd made an assumption early on in this process that all the metal was the same, because it all looks the same. But clearly it's not the same, because the stuff that went to Australia is the stuff with this green paint on. That is clearly aluminium-based. The stuff that went off to America with this green rubbery hexagon coating on it, that's a different material. So you've got two different parts here. So that was the first bit of uh, discovery, is that we've actually got different bits of material, plus the fact we never got the foil tested. So that, that's that's still out there to be done. Anyway, this stuff comes back, and then the lanthium's interesting because... It's quite common, lanthium. It's all over the place. It's number 27 on the ranking of most common materials on planet Earth. Yeah, it's used so in it's vacuum there... tubes and cathodes, right? Oh, yeah, it's all over the place. But it's also, it's, it's up there with things like mud and quartz and basalt. And, you know, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah. But, and this is where it gets interesting, it's also in the upper atmosphere. It's hmm. in outer space. It's in comets, meteorites, galaxies and other planets. So it is literally, it is literally everywhere. But then there's two important factors here that come into play. The first factor is both substances were totally unknown and did not exist in 1983, officially. So mm. that, that's your first thing to consider. And if it was flying around in the sky, let's say in the end of 81, the beginning of 82 or 83 when it crashed... Chances are that technology would have been in development for a number of years. So actually, you, what you're really looking at is the late 1970s. They would have had to have had the ability to develop that technology over three or four years out of the late 70s into the early 80s before that thing ever got airborne. So that's your first consideration. And the second consideration is when you're dealing with something like lanthium, it costs tens of thousands of dollars to extract so if you want to get a decent amount of it, you're looking at millions of dollars to extract. And, like, and you're still talking about 1983 here, you know. So you've got a substance, millions of dollars to extract, shouldn't exist, knocking around in 1983, and enough of it to cover four fields. That's about the size of two football pitches in debris. That's an awful lot of extremely expensive exotic material so when you actually look at that all of a sudden me and philip thought we were going to solve it you know we're being clever and thought yeah you know we'll get the analysis back and it'll be a piece of helicopter fuselage or something you know but no it's actually made the situation worse because we have got alien quote exotic material that should not exist and we've only managed to identify probably about 20, 25 percent of it because there's a shed load of other stuff involved in that that we haven't been able to analyze. Both labs couldn't analyze the resin properly, um, which we think is the, what, what the Australians are saying is glue. And clearly the Americans are saying it's not glue. So that contradicts. They've not identified the paint. They've not identified the rubberized coating and we've not had the aluminium foil analyzed. So. You know, uh, and what you were saying as well in the previous question before the break when you said, what about supernatural and unusual things, you know, happening? Well, when they came to microphotograph the lanthium, the lanthium metal, even after 40 years, was giving off some kind of a field or a signal that actually distorted the photograph. Huh. So the macro photo that was taken of it is distorted. Um, and we, we've put that in the book. You know, you can see it. And it's in the report. It says we had a hell of a job photographing this because it distorts when we try and photograph it. So rather than answering the problem, I think the rabbit hole just got deeper. <laughs> so, so, Mark, any idea what kind of purpose that lanthium could play in the body of... An aircraft of some kind. I mean, you know, has uh, have you looked in to see if there are any, you know, like military applications or if it's uh, you know, been used before in, you know, say like just your uh, jet fighters or things like that? Um, the when, when we started off, 
I'm going to say there's three analysis. So analysis number one was the British Aerospace one. And a couple of comments that were passed at that time, they said, well, this is a very pure alloy. We've not seen anything like this before. That's what they said. Um, but we do know that the duralumin that, that, we, that is being used, duralumin, by the way, is, is just um, a trade name. It's like, you know, McDonald's or Coca-Cola. Uh, they said the duralumin that we're using, because there are 200 different varieties, is not the type that we're looking at here, but it's used in the control surfaces on fighter jets, the uh, ailerons that direct the, the vehicles. That's where we were in the 1980s. This stuff that we've got now, which is the same material but with a better analysis, uh, nobody has the foggiest idea where this stuff's from or what it could be used for. I, I think... I think the aluminium is probably the internal shell. I think the duralumin is, uh, not the duralumin, the um, lanthium. I think the lanthium is the outer shell. And I think that the foil we've got, the tin foil, goes between the two. So what you end up doing is you end up with a thickness of fuselage, if you like, or, or shell, um, with the lanthium on the outside and the aluminium on the inside. That, that's how I think it, it'll end up working out. Um, but it's interesting because the bigger pieces of, especially the lanthium, they're all either concave or convex, depending on which way you look at it. Um, and Gary c quite graphically demonstrated how strong this big piece he's got is because you can stamp on it and it won't collapse. Mm. Um, it does have peculiar qualities, the lanthium. Um, Gary noticed if you attacked it with a hammer or a drill or, you know, a mechanical cutting device, it pushes back. It resists. And, and it's, you can't do anything with it. But if you actually go at it as if it was a piece of eggshell and you try and snap little bits off using a pair of pliers at slow speed and slow energy, you can do that. You can get bits off it, you know, that way, which again leads me to say, well, it's obviously designed for high pressure, high speed, you know, high resilience or a force field or an atmosphere of some kind. But when it slows down and it gets hit by trees, it smashes it shatters like eggshell, and that's how we ended up with it all over these fields, you know. So there are, like, little bits like that that you can sort of put into place. But, no, uh, certainly not in 1983. There was nothing flying around the sky that had anything remotely uh, resembling what we've got now. Um, and if anybody out there does happen to know what it is, uh, so far they're not saying. You know, they're keeping stum about it. <laughs> huh. that's so That's so fascinating. Because that's such, a, mm. that's such an interesting angle that that you don't really hear too much about. I mean, obviously, right? The tin foil, duh. You know, you 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 see that in, in Roswell, etc. There, but there is this 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 theory that I, I've heard posited many times, and you know, maybe maybe there's something to it, maybe there isn't. That there that you know, with with you know, Roswell here in America, um, that the the tin foil that was used was then sort of reappropriated and then you know released to the public. And in this in this instance, perhaps it is sort of the same um, with the lanthium as well. Perhaps it is that you know something was reverse engineered or or something like that. Uh, I mean, we will never know, but there but that is a really fascinating sort of aspect to it because it it does add a lot more questions to it. Yeah, no. yeah. I mean, sub, sub, subsequent to the analysis, um, you're absolutely correct to say. Could it be back engineered? So the, so the, the, the sort of three answers, if you like, the first answer is it's one of theirs, in which case it's alien and it comes from somewhere else, you know, and maybe it was an alien ship that came down at Roswell, you know, or then the other answer is it's one of ours, in which case it's super technology and nobody's talking about it. And then beautifully put, you've got the middle ground. Is it back engineered? Is it something we're doing so technically it's one of ours but also it's one of theirs you know is it as as a result of stuff that has come down in the past and we've you know appropriated the material and started to you know do things with it um i'd love to know the answer i don't think i go quite as far as that in the book i mean i have to say in the book i present the evidence right i give both of the uh, analysis reports in full um but then i go very very lightly in terms of making conclusions um, cause I'd really like to know. I'd love to know what the actual answer is, you know. Um, but yeah, nicely put, it could very well be back engineered. 
Ah, it's all just a theory here, folks. But it's, uh, <laughs> but it, but it is, it, it is interesting to think about because, you know, what, what happens with the debris? Where do they take it? What do they do with it? You know, it, obviously, as, as somebody who, who is at least vaguely intelligent, I would say that perhaps, you know, all right, you know, some alien technology landed here, you know, what do we do with it? You know, I would, I wouldn't lock it away. Maybe there's something we can do with it. Right, that would that would be my logic anyway. But logic dictates that it is about time for you to give us a little bit. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Mark, where people can find out more about you about the book, and then we can kind of hop into the last quarter of the show and talk about conclusions, implications, etc. So, where can people find out more about you? Find out about the book, etc., and what you're working on. Okay, I'm going to keep it really simple. I like it when things are simple. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I've got nine books out in total, and they're all on Amazon. Everybody can get them on Amazon. So type my name in. You'll find one about Disappearing Nines Legion, one about Robin Hood, one about the Green Man. There's a, with Philip, I've got the uh, Crystal Skulls and Human Heads. I've got um, Polychronicon of Merlin, Joseph and Arthur, which is a really fantastic book on King Arthur. You know, if anybody's into that, go and check that one out. And then, of course, I've got Europe's Roswell, 40 Years Since Impact. So they're all the recent ones. There's a few others. Go and find me on Amazon. Number two, if you want to have a look at some back catalogue and stuff, um, there's a company called Drake Michigan. We've just spent nine months putting all of my uh, production work up on YouTube. So, you know, get stuck in. Go and see what you can find. Lost Treasures, the ITV Granada Sky History series is on there. Um, you forgot to mention in the introduction as well, I also did the last series of Ancient Aliens. Oh. Uh, it's yeah. fairly, well, yeah, it's fairly obvious if I've got an interest in both areas that it, inevitably I'm going to finish up on there. Mm. I think I'm in the, the episode on cross, crop circles. But well, that's out there somewhere. I'm sure folks will mm. find that. And then number three, uh, number three, if you want to contact me, I'm on Facebook. Send me a friend request. As long as you've not got a photo of an angel and it, your name's Fifi Trixabel and there's nothing on your site, you know, in which case I probably won't accept you. But as long as you're a real person and you come and say hi uh, and you can chat with me on Messenger. So that's uh, Amazon, YouTube, Facebook. There you go. Interesting. Oh, yeah, no, lo- go, go check them out. <laughs> so I... I guess we get we uh, right on 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 the dot here for the for the quarter of the show, you know, brevity. Um, I guess one of the really interesting things that I I find about the paranormal in general, right, not just ufology or anything else, there's there's this idea that the the Greeks had, um, which is essentially there's a, a few different ways that we deal with knowledge, and we th- we think in different ways depending on you know what we're doing with knowledge, right? So you know you have. Mm. Knowledge, like technical knowledge, also known as techni, um, scientific knowledge, also known as epistemi. You have, uh, they include doxa, which is the knowledge of public opinion, and um, noose or noetic, if you want to call it that, which is spiritual knowledge, right? So the the argument being that, you know, you can find all the data that, that you want, you know, you have all the statistics, you have all, all, all of the evidence in front of you, right? But it still requires knowledge of public opinion in order to interpret the the and and you know all all of the evidence you've accumulated and that's the hard part because inevitably we're all going to be you know um influenced by different things and we all have our biases and we have all of our experiences that inform our experience of the objective reality in which case right you know we have all these substances we have them an- analyzed we have the data they are unknown but what do we do with it? And in this case, Mark, what do you do with it? <laughs> oh, that's a belting question. That really is a good one. Oh, dear. First time anyone's quoted Greek at me when they've asked me a question. Uh-huh. Welcome um, to Behind the Paranormal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 10 out of 10. Fabulous. That's a brilliant question. Uh, what am I going to do with it? Well, uh, from my point of view, having the information that I've got and the evidence that I've got, um, in the next 12 months, I'm really going to take it on the road. So in a sense, I mean, I've done the spiritual bit. I've done the physical bit. You know, I've done sort of the intellectual bit. But, 
you know, there's no substitute for taking something like this into the realms of public opinion. It needs to go out into the public, uh, the public domain. So um, I'm producing a PowerPoint on it. I've been booked for a few different conferences this next year. Um, in the UK, that is. And I do tend to tour the UK as well in the autumn, sort of August through to December. I've just, just come into the end of one now. Um, I've got three bookings left, and that's it for this year. So, um, you know, I'm going to do that next year. Number one, I'm going to really take it out on the road um, and see what folks say. I mean, there's no substitute at the end of the day for coming face to face with the general public. You'd be amazed, you know, that one day somebody might creep out of the woodwork and say, well, you know, I was involved in developing things for British Aerospace in 1981, 82. And I can tell you, you know, and boof, out it comes. Uh, they may not go on record, you know, they may not make it official, but I'm sure in the next year there will be more answers. Um, and no doubt a few more questions as well. I'd like to finish the analysis. It's not going to be a cheap thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do because we haven't got a limitless supply of this material, but certainly I would love to, uh, I'd love to do a little bit more analysis. Mm. And from my point of view, as you say, it kind of ticks all four boxes, you know, all the knowledge. It doesn't matter which avenue you take it down. Um, it, it clearly straddles all of that, you know. Mm. Um, it could be quite mundane. You know, it might just be a bit that's dropped off some enormous aircraft, you know, that, that we've been building. I mean, they've had 60 years plus since Roswell. They've had 90-odd years plus since the Second World War. So, yeah, fine, it might be ours. But then there's just that possibility that it might not be, mm. you know, in, in which case, where does it come from? You know, so in, in the PowerPoint, I'm going to get a bit more speculative because when you're live, you can afford to do that and talk a bit more about dimensions and time travel and probably some of the things the ancient aliens chaps will be interested in. You know, um, I'm going to go and fall off the edge of the flat earth, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess on, on, on that note, I suppose it's it's almost like taking a step outside of the ivory tower of academia. It's uh, mm. it's it's very you know you're you're getting out out of the echo chamber and kind of moving into the realm of of the people i suppose you know the the royal the people i guess um how have you had colleagues in the archaeological world react to any of this or do they just you know brush it off not care not a big deal you know we're we're stuck in trying to learn more about the anglo-saxons than worrying about this um i've had a really nice mixed response I have to say, you know, we're all terribly British, don't you know, over here. It's all done very English and all that. Mm. Uh, so we don't tend to have bust-ups in the uh, in the quad. You know, it doesn't happen. Uh, <laughs> Not quite, as quite, as it, it is over here. quite the same way. Yeah, it doesn't happen in quite the same way. So uh, I think up to the sort of early 2000s, I think everybody just had me down as a dedicated dirt archaeologist, which I was, but with a lot of other interests besides um, with the different societies and different things I was members of and friends I had and what have you. It was quite clear I was about as far over left field as you, you could get, you know. Um, and then I, I landed the ITV Granada series, 22 episodes, which is not bad going over five years. And that went out on Sky. And all of a sudden, the archaeological community, it was like I'd arrived. You know, they were all like, hang on a minute, this guy's doing TV. I was giving other shows like Time Team and what have you. I was giving them a run for the money. We were getting enormous viewings. Mm. Um, I mean, we predate Ancient Aliens. I'd argue we, we set a lot of the, the ground rules for that. And it was a crossover show. It wasn't just archaeology. It was reenactment. It was spirituality. It was mysteries. You know, uh, it was a damn good show. Go and check it out. It's on YouTube. But then after I'd finished doing that, I think a lot of the archaeologists came forward and they said, do you know what? We're going to start giving you information. We're going to start giving you the material because it will threaten our careers, but it won't threaten yours. Hmm. And that, seriously, that I was so flattered, especially, I mean, there's a, I can't name them, but there was a couple of guys that were instrumental in giving me material for the book on King Arthur. There's, there's a lot of archaeologists out there are convinced that Arthur's real, that he exists. And a lot of the mythology if you like on the welsh side of things a lot of that has got roots in fact you know we've actually dug some of the sites up so it, it's taken me on a journey where it, it's pushed me 
outside of, of, you know, what you might call normal academia, but at the same time, there's a hell of a lot of people in academia who I personally feel are, are sort of cheering me on. I see myself as an outlet for, for some of that material. Um, and, and, you know, 80% of archaeologists, if they're being honest, you know, we, we've all had supernatural and, and mysterious uh, occurrences and finds and things like that. And we use dowsing and psychometry and all sorts of stuff, which never make it into the official academic record, you know. Mm. Uh, and that's been going on for years. <laughs> So interesting because uh, I've heard so many different stories from different sort of wings of the the mm. sort of s- the historical studies. I guess you could call them that. I, you know, sort of the broad spectrum, not just archaeology, but like Egyptology and, and things like that, where somebody approaches something with a, little, a slightly odd take or perhaps you know something a little out of the box. They're just met with, "We're not talking about this." You know, they close the door, done. And it's so – that's very refreshing, honestly. <laughs> if anything, that's the yeah. most scientific approach because you consider new possibilities, you know. And yeah. I, I, I think that that's, that's wonderful, actually. And I, I do think – Well, it's, it's, I was going to say it's interesting, interesting you mention Egypt because, um, yes, the Egyptians are incredibly touchy because there has been i would say a lot of over theorization of that mm. you know there's there's been some theories have you know gone off into the stratosphere uh, and are clearly are unsupportable you know um i personally have got a reputation i'd like to think i've got a reputation for holding things down you know i am very sort of you know if it quacks like a duck and it shoots like a duck it's a duck mm. i like i like to have something in front of me that i can anchor on um so i i don't um, you know, I'd like to think I'm sort of the voice of reason. I don't kind of go off on a, a flight of fancy, which again brings us nicely back to Europe's Roswell and all this debris. You know, had we not had the debris and the eyewitnesses and everything to go with it, chances are I would never have been involved. You know, um, certainly not as a producer. I would never have done the documentary in the first place. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to think that's where I'm sat. But that helps. I think I think it gives people confidence in what I do, and I think that's why people speak to me, I think, ultimately. Interesting. So what do you think, Yeah, as we come down to the last few minutes of the show here, um, I, I want to, to ask you to kind of weigh in on, on what the future of, of ufology would be. You know, is is archaeology the way to go, sort of looking looking back to look forward, or, or what's what's your opinion? I'm going to use that magic word, disclosure. Mm. I think I think disclosure is the way forward. I don't think there's any other answer for that. I think there's a lot of people out there. It's like the us and them, you know, the great divide between the us and them. I'm sort of at the, the top end, if you like, of, of normal, average, everyday, ordinary people. Um, and I've gone as far as I can go. And I'm hoping this book is kind of, you know, scratching at the door of disclosure. Because the people who do know about these things and do have all the information, the distance is so broad now, it's gone so far, that needs closing. That, that's where the disclosure comes in. Um, the book, in a sense, is show and tell. It's got loads of photos, loads of things in there that people can see. And basically, the message I'm sending out is, you know, look, guys, we've got pieces of whatever it is that you've got flying around. So you may as well tell us what it is. Because it's in the public domain now. You know, mm. it's scratching at the door of disclosure. So I would certainly over the next few years like to like to have some answers. And I think the general population deserves some of those answers, you know. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I tend, tend to agree with that. But I don't know. I, I don't trust anything the government tells me, let alone <laughs> let alone if they're if they're telling the truth about about ufology. But that's a different debate for a different time. Um, well, spo- spoken as a true fan of the X Files. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you know? Uh, <laughs> but Mark, it's been it's been wonderful to have you on. Um, be, everybody, please please feel free to go check him out. Amazon, YouTube, all all sorts of wonderful things. Mark, Mark Ollie, everybody. And I guess now that we are coming down to the wire here, we can we can hop into our announcements. Uh, there are a number of great books by our friend Nick Redfern um, for sale temporarily at uh, DowsersSouthwest.com slash Greater New England UFO Conference. Uh, there are, is also a link on that to our home shape homepage that's behind the paranormal.com and you can check out all sorts of wonderful stuff there and i believe that tim is going to tell you a little bit about that yeah visit uh, that very website behind the paranormal.com 
where you can find nearly 1,200 hours of our regular shows and special broadcasts since 2008 from CBS Radio, Achieve Radio, and here on WOON, AM and FM. Also, hear many of these broadcasts on the major podcast platforms, including iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. And we don't want to forget about the charities as well that we have on our page, which uh, anything from USA Cares, Canadian Veterans Advocacy, uh, Help for Haiti's Orphans. Uh, We also have the Sisterhood of Ground Zero on there as well, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America. That's all on our charity page, along with many others that that we have adopted over the years. And these are charities that we care about and that we we know people that are involved with. So you can check out our website, BehindTheParanormal.com, and check out those charities. What's going on next week, Ben? Well, next week, uh, in one of the most important broadcasts we have ever done, uh, we have retired Bridgeport, Connecticut police officer Joe Tomek, uh, who joined my dad and Ed and Lorraine Warren in tangling with the Lindley Street poltergeist of 1974. Um this is Officer Tomek's first radio interview in 49 years, and we actually had the pleasure of going to see him when he was local. Uh, probably it was it was probably in the spring of last year, and man, it was it was like the the meeting of two old friends. <laughs> it it was uh, it was definitely an experience, and it's going to be a really really amazing uh, amazing show that we're going to have on as well. I look forward to listening to that show that sounds intriguing but we'll leave you today with a thought from zig ziglar you don't have to be great to start but you have to start to be great i'm tim swartz i'm paul eno and i'm ben eno and thanks for joining us on our great cosmic journey and we shall see you next time on behind the paranormal Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.